people who work for newspapers, photographers, when I started as a photographer, think that they can change the world. Deep down, I am a storyteller. And the skill set that I have to tell those stories is, is a camera. And uh, that's why I do what I do. I hope that our pictures and our, and our stories, I hope they make impact. I hope that our readers get something from there are many aspects of photography that I absolutely love. There's the, the art of it and the creating part of it. And then there's the, the first person witness to incredible events and the fact that you do have a front row seat to history. been two years since Katrina. The main thing we've learned is you can never do enough planning. We planned very, very well for Katrina, but we didn't anticipate that we'd have to evacuate in the back of trucks to Baton Rouge and put out a newspaper. I mean, there was no planning like, oh, well, if the city completely floods, we'll go to Baton Rouge and we'll do this. Everybody was just playing it by ear. Doesn't matter how prepared you are, uh, you, you know you really you know you can only be prepared so much for an event like Katrina. You know I grew up in New Orleans and I didn't grow up panicking every time there was a storm in the Gulf. Um, but it, there were clear signs early on that Katrina was going to be different. Um, the sheer size of the storm, the direction it was taking on the city, the night before Katrina. Most of us that had remained were in the photo lab talking with Doug about what we're going to do and where we're going to go. I had just gotten off the phone with the captain of the New Orleans Police SWAT team. They had afforded us the opportunity to essentially embed with the SWAT team. And I went to Doug and I said, Doug, do you want me to do this? I said, go do it. By mid-morning Monday, we thought the winds had died down enough that we'd try to send some people out, try to make some pictures. And the editors asked me if I could try to get to the Lower Ninth Ward because they were hearing reports that it was flooding. And so I was able to get there. It took me quite a while, but once I, I got close, I, I waded in about thigh-deep water to the bridge. And when I crossed over, this was the first scene that I saw. And uh, this was one of those traumatic moments where you're the only one there responding to this emergency. And and the women were looking to me to help them. And I asked them how long they'd been standing there, and, and they said since 8 o'clock that morning. And it, it was now almost 1 o'clock. Their, their plan at this point was to, to push the little girl to me, and I was begging them not to do that because the current going down the street between us was really strong, and I knew that once they pushed her, she would be swept away. I knew that I was going to encourage a horrendous photo to happen, photo opportunity to happen. And that just was awful in my mind. And so I made this picture and left. Then he came back to get a boat, to try and get a boat because he met up with some, some people that were trapped and he couldn't save them. Um, and he wanted to try and help them. And uh, so that he went out with a reporter at that point. And so when we got back to the um, the bridge and uh, looked over to the side, the, the porch was empty. And uh, my my worst fears were you know, came came right up. I just I just knew that they had tried to push the little girl across and that she had been swept under, and the rest of the family followed her. We had no communication with photographers. Our cell phones went wouldn't work. Like a day later, discovered that text messaging worked. We couldn't talk on the cell phones, but we could text message people. Someone on the team got a text message from a relative in St. Bernard that they were on their roofs. The SWAT team gathered up the troops, got, it, got the boats that they had, and proceeded to the Lower Ninth Ward, and there's nobody there yet. We are the first people to launch the first two boats in the Lower Ninth Ward. 
And these two people came out and opened the door of their house. They were in chest deep water. First, two divers were in the water and they grabbed Ms. Winter and brought her to the boat. And then her husband had brought Henry Winter out. He's coming out of the water. You can see it in his face, the concern. His whole world is water. He's lived in that house for years. And that was the picture that was the front page of the Times Picayune the first day after Katrina. Ted was out doing boat rescues. Brandon was out with the police. So I was really on my own. I was with reporters. The reporter and I went tromping through the water at Tulane and Broad and started looking around. And immediately I, I looked down Broad Street and saw these three men and this woman dragging this red tub as they grew drew closer, I realized those were children and babies uh, in, in there. But one of the things I remember is, is the woman said that these men were her heroes because they came to help her. She didn't even really know them, I don't think, and they came and helped her out. At this point, people were still sort of upbeat. I don't think they realized, as, as we had, that, that this was a major deal. By Tuesday morning, the water was up on the front lawn of the paper. At our calculation, we were estimating it was going up two inches per hour. And at that point, the publisher had no idea if it was ever going to stop. And I wanted to get out before we couldn't get out. The trucks could still get through. It was a little scary when there was a dip in the road because the water was going over the, the wheels. It was creaky. I didn't know if we were going to make it. Ended up in Baton Rouge about nine hours later or whatever, how long it took and worked out of there for until October. There were a couple of incidents where we sort of ran into situations to go and cover them and didn't fully apprise how much civilization had broken down in the last 24 hours. I was at the Walmart uh, uptown photographing the looting there, made pictures of, you know, just people coming out with giant television sets and that sort of thing. I was taking pictures of all of that, and one of our reporters overheard a group of guys saying the time speaking is over they're taking pictures let's take care of business i didn't hear this he did so he ran over to me and grabbed me and dragged me out of there um that was the first time i started to get a little scared to see how american human beings can just ravage a city but it says a lot about how pissed off they are you deny someone water for three days they'll do anything and I think that's why things continue to just deteriorate, because the help wasn't getting there. It was when those reports started coming in, you know, and you know that's when I was like, you know, wow, I've got to get in there. I've, I've, and that's exactly what I did. Um, I met up with Ted Jackson. On Tuesday night, when I had no place to sleep, I was able to get in touch with Brett Duke, and I begged him to come get me. He drove into the city and picked me up from Laplace and uh, took me to his house, and I slept on his couch that night. Me and Ted, one day we spent, you know, a half a day in the canoe, canoeing around and um, trying to make pictures. I kind of made decisions about who I could help and who I couldn't help. And I decided that if people were in the water, then I would help them. If they were on dry land, I would have to leave them for other rescuers. And uh, that's where my problems sort of began, because everybody wanted me to come get them, no matter what their situation was. And at one point, I felt like it was just best not to even acknowledge that they were there. And as I paddled under one bridge, uh, I remember the, the guy yelled at me, and I heard him say to the other guys with him, said, uh, if, uh, if we all work together, we can take it from him. And they all came running down the ramp to, uh, to take the boat, and I just out, outpaced them. On Wednesday, I was, the SWAT team, a group of the SWAT team had a mission. Their job was to go up Canal Street. They had a specific location where they got information that they were supposed to check. They had an address. So I went with them, and as we headed up Canal Street, we see these two people walking through the water with what looks like the door to a closet that's floating with some belongings in their dog, we had to go by them. We couldn't stop and help them because we had a specific mission. You can see their faces and their concern. They don't really know what's going on. I shot one frame. I shot one picture of this. And the guys I was with said, 
keep walking, head to the convention center. They were not in dire straits. So they were, you know, 10 blocks from dry ground. On Thursday morning, we uh, we woke up to the news that uh, a riot was happening at the convention center. And uh, I believe it was seven photographers that were sort of banded together at the time. I was, like jumped on top of this truck and drove t- towards the convention center. Just driving around the city at that time, you never knew who was going to jump out and grab your car. I decided that it, we should probably not go all the way, but stop and um, get out of the uh, and walk up. And so that's what we did. And I just knew that when we stepped on the convention center boulevard, that we would be rushed by this mob. And I was ready to run. I think everybody was. You know, when, 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 when we showed up at the convention center, you know, I was, I was scared. I was petrified. And when we made that last step onto the street, uh, there was a, a significant number of people that spotted us. Each person that ran up to us grabbed one of us. But instead of coming to hurt us, uh, they were screaming, the press is here, the press is here. I remember Angela Perkins grabbed my elbow and pulled me, and she said, you've got to see this, you've got to see this. And uh, this is where she took me immediately. She said, you've got to see this man. She said, they, they let him die right here in the median. And the man walked over and just lifted the blanket up and was, was telling us what an awful thing this was. And um, I shot quickly because I knew this wasn't going to last long, Sure enough, someone else came walking up immediately and, and screamed at him for for dishonoring the man this way. Somehow I ended up with, me and Ted ended up with Angela, and she wanted to take us around. And, you know, that's when she went to her, when we went back outside, she went to her knees and asked for help. Pressed her hands together like she was in prayer. I couldn't imagine, I can't imagine how she felt. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do. You see all these people at the convention center, what am I going to do? Call up the bus company and tell me a bus is here? I had people ask for things. You know, people with their arms outstretched. But I can't give out the three bottles of water that I've got to hundreds of people. I can't give out the three MREs that I've got to hundreds of people. I I laid my cameras down at least one point that I remember very vividly and and said, I don't want to do this anymore because of the the hurt in people's eyes when I shot their picture sometimes. I just didn't want to do it anymore. But five minutes later, it's it's, it's like, you know, this, this, this storm would not let you not shoot pictures. You know, it it, com- it compelled you to do what you did best, no matter what that was. And for me, it was to, to make pictures of what I saw around me. I shot pictures in self-defense because there was nothing else I could do. The best thing that we could do was to shoot, you know, be journalists, shoot, shoot pictures, tell these people's story, get them in the paper. At that point, you had to rely on the photographers, and their ability to become news gatherers. There wasn't anybody here telling them to go to the convention center or the Superdome or or do this or do that because our communication systems were out. I ended up going back into the city in a Humvee with the Army National Guard, but I had a camera instead of a gun. I worked out of the base. Uh, I did aerials. There was no door on these helicopters, so I was sitting sideways with my with my legs hanging over the side. I just kept shooting, and, and half the time I really didn't know what I was shooting because I couldn't recognize anything underwater. I felt like I was witnessing the city drowning. Frame by frame, I was watching the city drown. Thursday, I I flew and did some aerials all the way from St. Bernard up to the city. And when I saw the enormity of it, I think that's when it really 
it really hit me how big this thing was. It was like seeing the end of the world. I saw this lump of humanity just sitting in this field waiting for help. And about 45 minutes into this macabre scene, the buses pulled up. And there was no cheering and there was no no sigh. There was no nothing. It was just people just began to move. I looked down and I said, this can't be America. This is this is like everything I've ever seen from a third world country. You have the kind of the awful feeling inside that if a disaster happens, you're not going to be taken care of. There's a certain distrust now with government on all levels, local, state, and federal. Whenever the president came to town, I, I was the go-to local photographer. I think the picture of Blanco staring at Bush shows the division of the state and federal government and the frustration. She was just staring at the guy when he was talking at that point when I made this picture. You know, early on, it became clear that it was going to be a political mess. You know, legislation that's meant to help Louisiana and help us rebuild is either getting vetoed or it's getting a veto threat in Washington. So, in the end, did my efforts make a difference? I don't know. I mean, I hope what we were doing was showing these pictures that people needed help down here. You know, I was hoping that, I hope that happened. The tragedy of it is that a lot of us that work at the times speaking, a lot of us live here, have such a love for the city. And in most cases, you're not a dispassionate observer because this is your town. These are your neighbors. These are your friends. And it affects everybody. We were not immune from this disaster, which makes it unusual for us because we're as, as part of the, as much as a story as the one we're covering. And that's, that's very unusual in the news business. I think it made us cover the story better. I think that the people that I photographed were so happy when I said I'm the Times Picune photographer. People in this city love the newspaper, I think, more than other cities across America. I'm running into people in the city, and I'll walk up to them and say, Hi, I'm with the Times Picayune, and I get no more than that out of my mouth. And they said, You're still here. You know, it was a sign of hope to them that, that we were still here and we hadn't abandoned them. We produced the newspaper because we felt that that was the best interest of the community. Um, we wanted people to be informed by us, and we made a difference in their lives. And to me, that's the most satisfying thing about anything that we did during Katrina. The photographers, I mean, they were beaten up pretty good. You could tell after a few days that it was taking a toll on some of them. Yeah, I remember going to sleep every night, just exhausted thinking that I just can't do this another day. I've got to leave tomorrow. I've got to find a way out tomorrow. By Sunday, I wasn't functioning very well. The trauma of the event, and particularly flying over it and seeing how large an area of destruction it was, really got to me. People needed to get their personal life in order. Photographers needed to be able to find out if their homes were damaged or where their loved ones were. I lost my house. My whole world had been turned upside down like it was for so many other people. So trying to push that to the back of your mind and take pictures and, and keep doing your job was really hard. I think the storm has taken a, a, a toll on everyone, and um, we're all still processing what exactly, you know, it is doing to us or, you know, has done to us. And... a long road. A little more than a month after the storm, and people, the story at that point were people coming back to see what they had left. 
and we'd follow people into their homes for the first time, you know, trying to dig through and see what they could find. And I went to this one woman's home, home a Miss Godbolt, who lived in the, in the lower ninth ward. Her son had died earlier in the year in Iraq, and she wanted to go back to her apartment and find her son's uniform and the flag that had draped his coffin. And she found him, soaking wet, disfigured by mold, crushed under all the debris and detritus that had washed into her, into her apartment. And this picture is when she looked down and spotted her son's uniform, and she just burst out in tears. First of joy that she had found it, but then in sadness seeing what horrible state it was in. I was working on a story about the elderly and Katrina and how they were affected when I met Mr. Irwin Buffett, an 89-year-old photographer that had lost everything. In fact, I walked into his living room and every negative he had ever shot was laying in mud on the floor. The backs to his 4 by 5 cameras were strewn about. And he took me by my arm, and his his skin was really soft, and he and he was holding on to me. He was, he was a little bit frail, and he said, um, "You know, I lost my home, I lost my car, and all my friends are gone." He had this hopelessness in his eyes, and uh, he told our reporter that he could see no future. A contractor was so moved by the photograph and the story that he offered to gut the man's house for free, which he did. Unfortunately, Mr. Buffett was never able to move back into that house. Seven months later, his daughter called me and said he had passed away. And I went to his funeral, and she said Katrina did this to him. She said her father really had you know, some time left, but it broke his heart. I sit by a police radio at my uh, at my desk, and I listen to police calls all day. You know what I hear all day? 29S, 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 suicide. You hear them all day long. It's like an epidemic, but it's a quiet one. So Katrina is still churning out its victims two years later. There's still people dying from the storm. I really felt from day one that we were recording history. Our Times Picune photographers were recording history and we were witnessing history and that my work as a journalist has never been as, as important. What I do know is the cumulative effort of all the photographers on the street made a huge difference. And uh, you know, mine being among them, it's just, you know, uh, my small role in, in the bigger picture. The photographers will leave a legacy. They're historians with cameras. Ten years from now, the images that you look at will resonate with the people that were here just as much as it did during Katrina. And that's the best legacy you can have.